exciting program that Jonathan and Stan will be presenting to us. We have some business we need to take care of. First of all, anybody who's not a member and wants to become a member, here's the form. They're right up here. You can pick one up. Or if your membership is expired and you need to read it, your dates are on the envelope. Or if you don't know, I'm sure that Jim Ingalls can provide that information to you when you do expire. Right, Jim? And, uh, and beyond that, anybody who wants to contribute to the Lori Duncan High School Award at any time, all those uh, donations are welcomely accepted. We give an award to the high school, whoever applies and we feel deemed qualified that they are really value local history, that that's the criteria for it. And uh, give them up to $1,000, depending on how much we have collected and how much they, we feel that the committee feels they deserve. I shouldn't say we. Uh, I'm on the committee, usually, so. <laughs> anyway, this is my last night as president, so I'm stepping down. And But I want to thank everybody for all the support that you've given us and also asking for more support from people. At the same time, as we are moving forward and growing in a society, we really need members to step up and fill small roles along the way. Like uh, just helping getting the flyers out and or anybody with computer skills that can help with doing the website or uh, actually producing the flyer. Anybody that wants to volunteer to help bring uh, refreshments. Um, anybody that would like to be in charge of coordinating that refreshment thing. We have a sign-up sheet, and usually uh, one or two members of the board volunteer for every meeting. But then there's that business of calling to make sure they remember that they've signed up for next November or whenever. So if somebody feels they can do that, uh, please. Let any of us know, all right? And um, let's see. All right, now. Oh, and the archives. That's the other thing. The archives always needs help with volunteers. There's always stuff to do. We get big collections coming in all the time. And uh, we need help categorizing and filing and putting those in proper documentation and uh, also in folders and proper things to preserve what we get. So, and I'm sure anybody who doesn't, hasn't been down to the archives should make an effort of going down there and seeing all the things we have. Okay? Yes. Now, for the business of tonight, the main thing is electing new officers and uh, trustees. And for that part of the program, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Brown, and she will present a slate of officers. And Thank you, Diane. On behalf of the nomination committee, uh, we'd like to put forth to our members the following slate of officers for 2020. Uh, for President Robert McHugh, who's currently serving as Vice President. For Vice President John Flanagan. For Secretary Allison Meyer, and uh, continuing uh, uh, on another year in his term, Jim Inglis as Treasurer. We also have um, the following members being presented for three year term Mickey Prisco, Jean Hamm, Vivian Tucker, and a new member, Kevin McGrain. Uh, and then uh, for a one year term, which would be filling in for John. John Flanagan's uh, up to board member slot uh, would be Diane McNeil. So th that's the slate of officers and uh, uh, trustees that we put forth at the meeting today. Now, do we call for any nominations from the floor? Okay. No nominations from the floor? Nominations from the floor. Okay. Okay. Then I would ask. I move nominations be closed. <laughs> And the secretary cast one ballot. I second the motion. Well, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, to everyone, for their service. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of volunteers, one of the we just had a 
volunteer for a very vital position that we have been kind of lacking in actually having a lot of support for. Marianne Ramos has uh, agreed to be a coordinator with the school system between us and the historical, the historical society and the schools. She is a retired teacher from the Millbrook school system and she's the one that originated the fourth grade walking tour way back, I'm going to say 15 years ago or more. <laughs> and um, from there, from the walking tour, we actually started the Historical Society walking tour brochure. And we wrote that, we printed that up and passed that out. And then after that came the Museum in the Streets tour. So. She's the one that originated all of that, so I want to welcome her to that position and thank her for volunteering. Okay, now without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Jonathan Boyce and Stan Morse, and they can tell us about Mr. Boyce. Good I was saying to Charlie Simonson earlier, I haven't sat on a stool since I was sent to the corner in grade school. <laughs> so, we'll see. We, well, I think we can get through this. But, uh, ready? Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, thanks for being here on such a cold, dark evening. I mean, there's nothing more fun than getting a group of people together on an interesting topic in a warm, well-heated space that has plenty of light, and as I say, some entertainment. Entertainment for history, of course. I'm Stan Morse, and with me is my uh, cohort and friend, Jonathan Boyce. Uh, Jonathan is a director on the Society's Board, a uh, longtime member of our society. He's a historian locally, and you'll see that borne out in this evening's presentation. He's also a local businessman. There's something about Jonathan Boyce I don't think a lot of people know, or if they do, they're, they're keeping it pretty quiet. But uh, for those fortunate enough to attend the Duchess uh, County Fair every year, Jonathan and his family have been running that antique farm machinery concession in the middle of the fair. Now for, I think it's 53 years, Jonathan? 53 years. That's amazing. I guess uh, uh, Jim, uh, Jonathan's older brother, had it first, then Jonathan took it over, and I believe your nephew has it. Is that correct? So I'll tell you what, if you haven't been to the fair recently, it's well worth the trip. It's a lot of fun. And uh, stop by to see Jonathan because it's a, it's a, lot, a lot of good uh, machinery. Now, although that there are two of us sitting in front here, there are actually three of us doing the presentation. I'll get to that in just a minute, but the most important of the three, I think, is going to be Jonathan Boyce. He came upon tonight's story, he researched it over, I think, the better part of two years, right, Jonathan? Uh, a little over a year. <coughs> a little over a year, okay, fine. And then came to the program committee last year at about this same time to recommend it for a program this year, and the committee liked it, and that's why we're here tonight. Now, it's the uh, society flyer that you got in the mail this last 10 days or so. Uh, as indicated, this will be a conversation between Jonathan and me. And it's in the question and answer form, Q&A, that we haven't used much over the years, but we thought you might enjoy tonight, particularly with this subject matter. Now, during our conversation this night, we'll be using a series of uh, photographic images provided by Linda Colts, a map of Italy, which is right over here, we'll get to that in a little while. Photography of an airplane that was involved that was absolutely key to the story tonight. We have several display items on that table over there, which Jonathan has made available, and you can see at your convenience and leisure after the program is over. Now, there's one thing. I've made a lot of presentations. Jonathan has it not. I think he has maybe a little concern about 
uh, a lot of questions and answers coming from the audience. So we'll say if you can't hold back, fire away with your questions, but otherwise we will have a question and answer period at the end of tonight. Now our uh, program tonight was helped along very nicely by two <coughs> board members. One, Linda Coles, who did a tremendous amount of work. I'm seeing it for the first time tonight, but Linda did a lot of work on the photography and the projection system for tonight. And Allison Meyer, who suggested the format for tonight. So I guess we're ready to go? I'm ready. All right, fine. Sounds good. All right, fine. First question, Jonathan. The subject of this evening's program is a Millbrook native by the name of Joseph C. Volk. V as in Victor, O-L-K. Would you please tell us how you got started on researching Joseph Volk? Joseph Volk was a young man from Millbrook. To give you some background, late in the winter of 2018, a friend told me that he had some important documents, pictures, and a history from a Millbrook family which had lived here since around 1910. <coughs> now, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Good. There was no family left that had any interest in having or preserving the items, so they could easily have been lost forever. As I looked them over, I realized that I had known three of the people mentioned. I accepted responsibility for the documents and photos, knowing they would be properly cared for in the Millbrook Historical Society archives. When I had time to study them carefully, I realized there was a story here which had to be told while there are still people left who knew the family. I was holding part of this man's legacy in my hands. It was a humbling experience. My friend who saved the history, Russell Bonk, is from the town of Clinton, and he is here tonight. Would you identify yourself? Yes, that's me. Great. Oh, Hello. wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for your help. It's fun. Thank you. I'm glad it ended up in good hands. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't for Russell, we wouldn't be having this program. That's <laughs> probably true. It, it is true. It is true. <clears throat> His wife, Stephanie, had cared for... Anna Volk Knobloch, the last remaining family member in her home in Pleasant Valley for the final months of her life. She was married to Paul Knobloch, an executive at the Bank of Millbrook. He had worked there for over 20 years, and at the end of his tenure in the late 70s, 1970s, he had been named Senior Vice President. This program tonight is not about Anna or Paul. It's a story about Anna's brother, Joseph Folk Jr. Anna Knobloch's mother's name is also Anna, so I shall refer to her as Mrs. Volk to avoid confusion. Okay, you just uh, mentioned uh, just now <coughs> that you knew three of the people that were involved in the materials here tonight. That strikes to me as a uh, uh, personal uh, connection. Would you describe that personal connection, please? Well, I have a personal connection to the story. I worked for Mrs. Volk mowing her lawn at her home for two summers, 1971 and 1972. <clears throat> Mrs. Volk's home was next to St. Joseph's Church on North Street, right here in Melbourne. Near the end of my second season of working for Mrs. Volk, her home was sold and she went to live with the Knobloch's in Pleasant Valley. I remember this clearly because they asked me to clean out the garden shed behind the house. This may have been the beginning of my collecting addic addiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's the house. It is a pretty house, isn't it? And a little lawn, a <laughs> big lawn. A uh, lush lawn, big lawn, and yes. Good. The house is closer to the road than it appears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's always the case. Yeah. Right down here, next to St. Joe's, is that right? Next. Okay. Good. One of the pictures you can actually see on the left, you can see a little bit of. So it's between St. Joe's and Fountain Place. Yeah, it's the yeah. old house. Yeah. Okay. 
You would know that as a fireman, wouldn't you? What's that? You would know that as a fireman. Oh, uh, yeah, kind of. Very good. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Who is Joseph Volk? He was born on September 10th, 1917, at 4.45 a.m. We verified this through the village clerk's office. We know he graduated from the Thorne Memorial School, right across the parking lot here. According to a Millbrook Roundtable article we have here tonight, he was active in sports and was well liked by the other students. Upon graduation, he worked for a few years in Connecticut for the Remington Arms Company. In January 1943, he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, and after getting his pilot's license in Texas, he was commissioned to rank a second lieutenant. On overseas duty in Italy, while flying from Italy, delivering food and other supplies to Greek patriots, he and 11 comrades were killed, and both engines on their plane failed <coughs> and crashed into a mountain and burst into flames. The date of the crash was September 10th, 1944. He died on his 27th birthday. Just take a moment to think about that. Yeah, I was, was going yeah, to ask, the, does anybody see any coincidence in the dates here? If you put 365 people in a room and they passed away one by one, chances are one of them would be probably on their birthday. But I think it's a little unusual. We have a small village here. Uh, I think there were, I think by your best count, there are 10 uh, casualties, deaths yep. in World War II yep. across all the services. We'll get to that later, yeah. That's a, that's a small amount, but to have one of them on a birthday, that's, that's unusual. Okay. Uh, after the family was notified about oh. Joseph's death, and by the way, the method of tradition or traditional method of notification of death for a family is by telegram. And uh, that was the method used in World War II. Uh, we know that he died on September 10th, 1944. We have tracked down uh, the fact uh, by reading newspaper accounts and extrapolating dates that the family was probably notified by telegram within two weeks. Two weeks. Why did it take so long? Well, think about it. It was World War II. Anybody have any idea how many people died in World War II who are U.S. citizens? But what's that guess? 500,000. Ah, just a little bit high. 400,000, 407,000, I believe, is the number that I came up with by doing an internet search. So, yeah. And he, I, he died in Greece. Yeah. Ah. It was a plane crash, is that right? Okay. The, what's that? Giving it away. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going ahead. I'm, going, I'm, I'm getting ahead of me. Um, I just got my come up this year, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, after uh, the family was notified of Joseph's death, what did the family learn about that death? And from whom, Jonathan? This is a personal, heartfelt account of the tragedy of Joseph Volk. It's, it's a letter from. Captain Max Goldschlag to, to John Volk. Uh, I will read it. Uh, note the date. Five months after his death. February 25th, 1945. John Volk. I am in receipt of your letter dated February 9th and regret terribly to learn that a previous letter that I wrote to your mother never did arrive. I shall try to give as much of the details surrounding Joseph's death as I possibly can. At the time of the unfortunate accident, Joseph was dry, flying with our best pilot and, and then commanding officer of the squadron, Captain Paul E. Davidson, who also died, as did all members of their ill-fated crew. They were on a supply mission to Greece, 
from a base somewhere in Italy. Food, clothing, and medical supplies were to be dropped for starving the struggling Greek resistance members. This particular mission had been flown before and required fly, fine flying skills. Joseph was proud to go to fly with his CO. On this flight, they reached their destination and preparing to unload cargo when mechanical difficulties seized the ship. Flying a low rate of speed in order to make a successful drop, they were quite unprepared for trouble. The plane crashed into a hill. All on board were killed. Burial services were conducted, and bodies buried somewhere in Greece. I regret that I must be so blunt in communicating this sad news to you. Joseph was a new member in our unit, but it didn't take long for him to get acquainted and earn the respect of all who knew him. The enlisted men liked him particularly because of his easy and tolerant nature. We all mourn his accident and miss him to this day. I kindly deliver my respects and that of every member of this organization to your bereaved mother. Your brother went down fighting. I trust I may have been, that I may have been of some service. Respectfully, Max Goldschlag, Captain A.C. Adjutant. Okay. Well, now we know when he died, where he died. There's some funny things about it. We just, just we started talking about it, so we decided to do a little research. Here's a map of Italy, or I should say the lower half of Italy. Rome well, being up in through here, the traditional booth we all learned about in grade school down here. <coughs> and when Joseph Folk was posted to Italy, he was sent to an air base near Brindisi, Italy, right on the Adriatic coast. I asked Mary about it, my wife, and she said it's kind of arid down there, and uh, quite dry and quite flat. So that would say, you know, probably a pretty good location for an airstrip. Also, geographically, you have Sicily over here, you've got the Croatian and Montenegro coasts over here, Adriatic through here, and the Greek islands where Joseph perished are approximately where I'm just drawing in the air with my finger. <laughs> the flight from Brindisi to where the flight went down, probably not more than about an hour, even with a slow moving aircraft like they had. But what about that aircraft? Uh, I would hope that most people in the audience would be familiar with the Designation DC-3. Workhorse of the aviation industry in World War II and Korean War and even Vietnam. A couple pictures off the internet here. I'd like to just root it around the audience and get it back when you're done with that. But the plane that went down was not a DC-3. It was a modified DC-3, and that's what the military did. They adopted a civilian aircraft that was already made in production, even in existence on the line, and then made the necessary modification. By the way, in World War II and in Korean War time, there were 10,000 of these D-3s produced by the Douglas Aircraft Company. They made modifications. They put a new cargo door on the back. They strengthened the flooring. They put a tail column that facilitated dragging the plane on the ground was necessary, and they put a little aerodome on the front, right back of the cockpit, so they could look out. Otherwise, you'd be blind to what's behind you. The plane would carry up to 30 troops and crew, had various names. It was called variously the Dakota. It was called the Goonie Bird. <laughs> When I was in Vietnam, it was called Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> That's not a joke, because Puff the Magic Dragon was a killer of a plane. Two Gatling guns, fast-firing tracer bullets in both of them on either side of the plane. And at night, 
a steady stream of fire from that muzzle of that Gatling gun all the way to the ground. And yet Tracer bullets made only one out of every six. Bottom line is that this DC-3 converted to a C-47, which is what went down, is versatile, reliable, and above all, safe. One of the safest aircrafts ever made. Now, moving beyond the aircraft, what was the official notification about Joseph's death and from whom? And interestingly enough, whereas Joseph died in September of 44, and Goldschlag's letter was February of 45, I believe it was? September 16th, 1948. Okay, well that's, that's the one that uh, I'm going to read right now. Um, here's a letter that because although the Volk family had been notified of his death by telegram, followed up by a letter some four to five months later by this adjutant major Goldschlag. There was a real nagging doubt in the minds of the family, particularly the mother. What really did happen? It took the better part of four years for him to get an official letter. And that may go back to the business of how many people die in a war, particularly World War II. Well, he said 407,000 or more. That's just dead. Wounded were another 600,000. When you have that many people to process and to notify and to find things about, mm -hmm. it takes time. And here's the letter that was sent to Mrs. Volk in 1948, explaining the best indications. I'll read it. 16th September 1948, Dear Mrs. Volk, I have received the letter from the office of the Quartermaster General a copy of your letter concerning your son, 2nd Lieutenant Joseph Sevol, whose death occurred 10 September 1944. Your desire to learn as much as possible regarding the death of your son is most understandable. Information available in this office reveals that Lieutenant Volk was the co-pilot of a C-47 type aircraft which departed from the base at Brindisi, Italy on a mission to deliver six American paratroopers and supplies to a point in central Greece. During this mission, after the secondary, after the customary part drop on the first run, both engines of the sun's plane seemed to cut out simultaneously. Both engines. Immediately after, a parachute flare was fired from the plane, which means they recognized something was wrong. It crashed into a mountainside in Greece, burst into flames, killing all occupants. <clears throat> I regret that I have no further information to give you concerning the death of your son. Sincerely signed, Edward Witzel, Major General, Adjutant General of the U.S. Army. Four years to get that information. Okay. Well, we're already up to after World War II ended, Jonathan. Was there an official newspaper account about anything about Joseph Volk after that time? We had a newspaper clipping from the time of Joseph's death with a civilian picture that will be on display on the table over here after the program. Okay, fine. Uh, do you have that? Uh, would you tell us? Joseph was buried originally in Greece and then was disinterred, as is the practice after wars are over. And what happened to Joseph's remains at that time? Well, after that first newspaper clipping 
that I just mentioned to you is another one from later on. Okay. The Kipsey Journal carried a notice about Joseph being buried at Arlington National Cemetery in the near future. The article has the date of May 22nd, but no year. So we are not sure what year it was. An inscription on the back of the article gave a clue as to the year, but with no answer. Here is an ad for Halstead and Cadillac Oldsmobile on Church Street in Poughkeepsie, which lists eight cars from the year 1950 or earlier. None of them Cadillacs or Oldsmobiles. I knew they were used cars and that Joseph was probably interred in Arlington in 1950 or more likely later. Searching further, I was directed to the Arlington National Cemetery website, <clears throat> and there I discovered a photo of the headstone and year of burial of all 12 airmen aboard the crashed C-47. Do you have any information about what was on that headstone that you could share with us? Yes, I do. It says, it says United States, top six soldiers are Americans. The third one on the bottom on the right is Joseph Seagull. Can you point to that, Jonathan? Sure. <laughs> South Africa, and it says aircraft accident Greece, September 10th, 1944. Were they all on the plane? Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, for the sake of clarity, Robert, uh, uh, Linda, I would suggest don't do anything with the slides, leave it on. Could you just kill the lights over there? Maybe we could see the slide a little bit more. That's a good idea. Or not. <laughs> perhaps a little bit, perhaps. Okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> photography is sometimes difficult to uh, get so that it's absolutely accurate. And Paul C. Davidson, he was mentioned. The rest of them were not. Except for Joseph. Okay. So, he was buried in Greece, disinterred several years later. Brought back, buried in Arlington with full national honors. If anybody's ever been to Arlington Cemetery, you know where full honors are. Very impressive and very well deserved. Okay, so the Arlington burial was May 22nd, 1951, which, which makes total sense by what I found on the back of the clipping. That's right. Joseph had finally arrived home in the U.S. after seven years. <clears throat> Joseph's brother John also served in the war. I have no information on him except that he is deceased. I believe he lived in the area but was not close to the rest of the family. All right. So the family was notified. He was buried in Arlington. You know what the dates are. Was, Jonathan, was there any other recognition provided, let's say, locally? Oh, yes. That's what we'll get into now. Joseph name, Joseph's name is on the World War II monument at the Tribute Garden in Millbrook. The bronze plaque in the center is World War II. The one on the left is Korea, and the one on the right is Vietnam. World War II. In the center. Yep. There are many names listed on the monument. Too many to mention here tonight, but they all have stories which should be told. Ten of those listed in the center have a star beside their name, including Joseph. Along with nine others, he was killed in action. That is a lot of loss for a small town. Ten deceased. Does everybody know what the population of Bills or Millbrook is? It's under 1,500. Ten of our citizenry killed in World War II is notable. It's a lot, of, a lot of funerals in a short period of time. You betcha. Absolutely. 
Okay. Um, Jonathan, what happened to the Volk family in the 1950s and later? Well, Paul Knobloch, Mrs. Volk's son-in-law, also served in the military. Growing up in Limbrook, Long Island, Paul came to the area in the 1950s. He died in 2007 at the age of 93. Paul never met his brother-in-law, Joseph, but he probably knew the story of how this young man died too soon. This is a heartbreaking story, but thanks to a friend and caregiver, to Mrs. Volk, who saved this important material, we have this moment to honor this young man and his family. In closing, there must be more people in the audience and in our area who have memorabilia and stories of heroism. I hope they come forward so we may have other programs to honor the greatest generation. All right. Well, the Knobloch came, came to the area. He worked for Mid Hudson Oil Company. I, I worked with him there. Okay. Well, I know he lived in Poughkeepsie for a while. Huh? I know he lived in Poughkeepsie for a while. Yeah. I worked with him there. I was in 1957. <coughs> Well, I, I think Jonathan's brought up an excellent point. Uh, is anybody in the audience familiar with or know of documentation on deceased military residents of Millbrook, or town of Washington for that matter, that might be able to help tell the story a little bit more? Because one of the things that, that I got interested in was I, when, when Jonathan proposed this, I said, you know, there, to my knowledge, there are only two uh, people who were killed in wars from Milburn who have received recognition of the public that I'm aware of. I mean, I've lived in Milburn for 35 years. One of them was a, a Civil War veteran uh, by the name of Levi Rust, whose story was told in a Civil War briefing that was done several years ago. And we told all we could tell about that. Joseph Volk tonight and John Peter Manson from Vietnam. Those are only three that I know of that have had any Bill money. Bill money. Bill money. Bill money. money. I'm sorry. Bill Bill money. Bill money. <clears throat> okay. All right. Good. You're aware of recognition given? No. No. No, no not recognition given. No. Yearbook dedicated to him the year he the number high school yearbook? Well, uh, does anybody attend the Memorial Day services here sponsored by the VFW? Well, if you do, you know that there's a point in the program after the Flanders Field and the Gettysburg Address and the speeches are all made when there's a tribute to all the war dead from the town of Washington, starting with the Civil War and moving forward. Yes. And the names are announced and the bell is rung for each one. I'm sure I've heard Joseph Volk's name before, but I'd never clue as to what it was about. Thanks to Jonathan, we now know. And it takes that type of recognition of what's there, the value of it, and then prosecuting it, as, as it were, to get it historically done. Alan? Well, every year, uh, now this is very interesting for me because every year before the memorial they prayed, we have a little ceremony in front of the firehouse. And it's always been there, and I just didn't know who he was, but our little memorial in front of the firehouse is dedicated to Joseph Volk. And we lay a wreath there in honor of him. So now it's kind of interesting to know a little bit about him. Why, why does the fire company uh, recognize Joseph Volk? I, I don't know. Okay, Joseph, maybe? Joseph Volk and a person, I don't know his first name, his last name is Massarelli, are the two active firemen that died oh. in the line of, of service. Oh. So their names are on a, a stone in front of the firehouse, but they were active firemen, unlike others that have been killed during the war that were not active. Mm -hmm. But they were active at the time mm -hmm. they were killed. Mm -hmm. And Volt is one of them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's an important mm -hmm. local tie. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, Mickey, when, when would oh. that stone or memorial have been put in front of the firehouse? Because the 40s to 60s, was it, when the firehouse? Yeah, yeah. Well, early yeah. 50s, I would say.
because I remember it. I grew up right there. We used to play around it. Mm -hmm. And then when this guy bought the old firehouse, and they moved that stone they down there, yeah. down to the new firehouse. But that was up on Church Street for years and years. Ah, yes. I think, yes. I think it was Paul Massarelli. But yes, that's what? I don't remember. It was a Massarelli and Volk. And the stone is there, and there's a, an American flag right behind it, uh, in front of the firehouse. So they were active members. Mr. Bach, yes, any, any additional comments that you would like to... Uh, I, I think it's rather... Uh, it is a very close emotional story. Um, I found the documents and the paperwork in an obscure trunk in, in, a, in a very, very secretive spot of the attic of Anna's house down on uh, Smith Road in Pleasant Valley um, after she had passed. And in cleaning the house out, uh, is when I found it, and I immediately knew it had to come back to somebody connected to Millbrook in some form, and Jonathan was the man. <laughs> At that time, you didn't know I was part of the Historical Society. I knew you were part of the Historical Society. I didn't know to what depth and, you know, what, what you would do with this documentation once I gave it to you. And you um, didn't know my connection to the family. I, I, when I first saw this stuff, I was shaking. Yeah, yeah. In, in your driveway, <laughs> when I handed it to you, 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 you told me about the mowing of the lawn in the 70s and, and how you knew the, the Volks. Um, Anna, in, uh, in her last few months of life, um, she did slip a little bit, but she still was very, very crisp and very uh, spry. And... She, to my knowledge and to my wife Stephanie's knowledge, uh, she only mentioned one time Joseph. Um, so whether she held him dear and close to her heart, or whether time had just taken its toll and she had forgotten. Um, so I'm not sure of, of that. But um, it, it is sad, uh, you know, touching on the local history and, and paperwork and documents. I have found in, in house cleanouts and, and, uh, and picking and gathering Civil War discharge papers of family members who just don't want them. Th this is garbage. I don't, you know, throw it in the dumpster. And, and I've managed to get a few documents into, you know, proper channels to, to, be, to be sectioned away for, forever and preserved. Um, but I think of the, the two or three or four incidents I've done, and I'm one person on the planet, how many have been lost forever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and never will be documented? Mm -hmm. And that's that's a crying shame. That's that that's a, that's the sad part of this. It is. Uh, Jonathan and I, when we were working on a script a couple of weeks ago, um, we were remarking that uh, we have another member of our society, Joe Magnarella, who works at the recycling station, and mm -hmm. Joe is. I, don't, I won't say it's every week, it's not even every month, but periodically, people will throw out historical documents that Joe's clued in. Yeah. And he's looking he's for... quite a collector. What's that? He's quite a collector. Yes, he is. <laughs> and he turns them over to people that he knows and trusts can do something about it. And it, that's a wonderful thing. But we're, I, I'm amazed about how much history goes to the recycling station. Unprocessed, unrecognized every year. You had a question. Yes, I did. Uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you said there was a, a, almost a two year, I think it was two years, between the original notification to the mother, to Joseph's mother, and then a formal notification. And as you were talking, I was thinking, as I remember, you said the plane left Italy, went across the Adriatic, and hit a mountain and burst into flames. So could it be that there was this big, and the mother was never satisfied, and she kept asking, and finally she got the final notification. Could it be that the bodies were, if it was a flame, a fire, and this plane went down, that forensics then was not the forensics and the DNA that we have now, <coughs> and the war and communications, and yeah, I mean, I wonder how many, you know, 
mistakes were made or anything like that? Well, count, count on it. There were, there were always tons of mistakes made for wars. Identification, processing, timing, timing delays. Yeah. I mean, it, because it, usually it was their, their, you know, their... Their dog tags. Their dog tags, because I have some. I have some. A lot of those and only dog tags they could go by. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So I, I they melted in the crash. Uh, that right. Was, uh, it's, 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 they're stainless steel. How did they that know? Tough. You know, maybe that's what took the two years, and the mother, that's why she just didn't <coughs> have that sense of authority that a mother would know. Yeah. Good point. Good yeah. point. Diane. Isn't it strange that both engines will fail at the same time? Oh. Yes. Well, how do they know? Uh, how do they know? Whoa, I thought about that question. They had delivered one drop, so they were near the... Yes, apparently... <coughs> and they were going to give more, drop more, evidently. Uh, did you get that feeling that there was a second drop plan? From the Wessel letter? I'm not sure. I got picked up on that, too, just when you read it. Yeah. It's a possibility that it was the first drop, and then my understanding is that the plane was going very slowly. And uh, it could have stalled. Who, who knows what? I mean, it's fine. But you don't know, and we it can't. We can't. Prove there was no forensics after all. Was that the letter that came yeah. five years? Yeah. Four, five, yeah. The customary part drop on the first run of both. Mm -hmm. First run. Both engines of your son's plane seem to cut out simultaneously. That's unusual right there. But they said <laughs> yes. first yeah. drop, which made the <laughs> <laughs> big boy drop again. A second time. Yeah, it sounds that way. Good point. Good point. But the South African, I'm very curious to know what that group was. It was a mix of people on that plane. Yes, but the uh, DC-3 converted to C-47 was a transport ship, and I, 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 I... But what agency was dropping these things? It was the Army Air Corps. Yeah. You see, there was no Air Force, U.S. Air Force. But why was, was the, there was somebody the from South Africa? Uh, it could be mutual support. He, I mean, he, uh, was, he was a British, British soldier. British. I would think. I would think. Ah, oh, that was British. Yeah, see, I don't. I, I don't have a problem making a connection there because uh, when I was in Vietnam, there, there were uh, friendly forces from both Korea and uh, oh. Australia yeah. operating with U.S. forces, and they would hop rides, and literally, yeah. on planes yeah. from going yeah, there. South Africa there. was British at the time. Say again. South Africa was British at the time. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Alan. I wonder, you know, before you got on the plane to fly the mission, you must have left some personal belongings back at the air base. They all must have. I wonder what happened to your personal belongings. Sure. Sure. As for the, the, the question about the DNA, though, uh, how did they identify? How did they know? Yeah, if it was uh, burst into flames. Yeah. Well, no, we didn't, we didn't have the DNA uh, process going for us. But we didn't have the FAA. The Federal Aviation Administration in its current form, <coughs> working to identify where the crash was and so on. We don't know, after the research we've done, where in Greece this happened. It said near Athens. It did say they were buried near, they were bu officially buried near Athens, yes. Buried near Athens. What was the crash? I don't know. That's why it took four years. Well, and I don't, I don't think that's untoward, uh, because... You know, it said they went into a mountain, didn't it? What's that? They, didn't it say they were flying low and into a yes, mountain? Yes, it crashed into a mountainside. That's correct. Well, then both engines failed. And the thing in my mind, and Mary and I are, have a pilot's, private pilot's licenses, it's inconceivable to me that both engines on the model most reliable, safe aircraft in aviation history talked out at the same time. There's no way of knowing that that's really true. What's that? There's no way Probably no one can actually There were no survivors. I mean, well, there were no survivors, survivors there but there, there, was a, there was a clue, though, that was something wrong because the flare was fired from the plane before oh, it went yes. down. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. Somebody observed the flare. 
Who observed it? Probably one of the three forces on the ground. The term is seem to cut out. So seem to cut out. That's kind of vague. Now, yes. I want to bring up that the first letter was handwritten and unofficial and on like a legal pad. And when you touch it, it, it kind of wants to fall apart. So we have it, but uh, we make copies of it, people can look at it. Yes, ma'am. Well, remember that Greece was in the throes of, of World War II at that time, and then after that, they had the communists come in. So there probably was a lot of delay right. in getting information from the U.S. The bureaucracy of governments. Okay. Any other questions or observations? Yeah. We'll try our best to answer. I bet, I, bet, I bet the reason why there was an Englishman and a South African part of the Arlington is because they, they, they couldn't distinguish uh, the American bodies from theirs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they simply bury them en masse, or respectfully, en masse. Yes. Now, I wonder if there might be another similar stone in a British cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Which not? one? Where? <laughs> all right, all right. Very good. We, have a, we have a picture over here of a plaque on the ground, which I always assumed was from Greece, but I don't know that. In sum, first of all, thanks for being here again. I'm not the person behind this. The man behind the story and the research and the perseverance of this story is Jonathan. I think we all owe him a round of applause. Anybody who's interested in a ornament of, of the library or the one for the Thorn Building from last year, they are available at Merritt Bookstore or through the archives of Kathy Derringer. If you want to order their nice presents, small presents for uh, anybody who needs a little memorabilia from Merritt. Yes. And the other thing, Allison, programs for next year. We forgot to talk about those, so if you want to. I will just very quickly slide. In the meantime, I want to thank Jonathan and his team again. So I think this board that was great. Well, I want to thank you for coming over to the format. Oh well, you know. <laughs> and I want to thank Linda for all her work. Yes. All of it. She put a lot of hours. Yeah. And she coached me on how to speak. <laughs> I guess it worked. I don't think so. It did. You need coaching. Oh yes, I do. No, I think the format was very good. I really enjoyed it. Um, okay, so we just want to give a couple teasers for next year, for 2020. We uh, have started to get together for our program committee. Um, so, uh, Brad Roller in March will be giving a talk on Mary Flagler Carey, uh, the artist of Canoe Hills. And so, probably most of you, at least many of you, know Brad and his work at Cary for 27, 30, 37, 30, 37 years. years. So, that will be a treat. Um, then in April, we are having our April meeting at the Millbrook Winery. And just as we had a program at the Millbrook Winery last year for the Tavern Trail, um, we had two programs last April. But this year, we're making the Tavern Trail our monthly program for April. Um, there will be a cost to uh, attending that, you know, for food and um, whatever has to be covered. But anyway, it should be terrific. Um, it'll be with Larry Hamm, and he'll be talking on the history of jazz um, and playing as well. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, then the annual tea this year, we are going to hold at the Millbrook Library, and it will be showcasing Sally O'Brien and all of her work that she's done. You know, every file you look in, in Millbrook, Sally's name is in there. <laughs> Whether it's on composting, or needlework, or art in some facet, or jokes being told, I think, to the senior 
So we are we are going to toast her, I think. Um, and then in October, Betsy Park will be talking to us about the 100 years of history of the Santa Nona Hairhounds. Um, that year has come up now. Uh, the Santa Nona Hairhounds, which are located on Thorndale. Um, Betsy Park, uh, who's a former huntsman for the Millbrook Hunt, but she works with the Santa Nona Hairhounds. Hair, hair um, she'll be talking on their history, 100 years that it was um, brought to its location, I guess, at this point. Um, there are lots of other programs in there too. But uh, January and February's program yes. are not going to be here on Thursday yes. night. They're going to be at the library on a Saturday afternoon. So, because we decided we don't always want to come out in the cold and the dark in the middle of the winter. <laughs> so we figured it would be easier to do it in the afternoon there. That's right. Okay. So I'm really glad you brought that up because there are about three programs now that we're planning for the library and we're trying it out. So come and support that if you like that idea, <laughs> to show that, you know, we can have it during the afternoon and on a weekend, and we'll see how it works. And it'll, it'll be up to your attendance. <laughs> so that's it. If there's no other questions, anything else that needs to be brought up? I forgot. Yes. Could we all thank you for being our president?